If you think that making five melee weapon attacks every single turn in D&D sounds like a lot of fun, then you're going to want to watch this video. Welcome to D4. Buenos dias amigos! So here at D4, each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for our favorite TTRPGs. We theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a particular character, but to explore one potential way to build a character that's both really fun and powerful to play in-game. So if you enjoy creating characters for your role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on a character that you're thinking about trying out, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I am so glad you're here. I truly am. So thanks for being here. My name's Colby. I post videos every Tuesday, and I'd really appreciate it if you would like, comment, subscribe, and apparently I'm also supposed to be asking you to ring the bell. I have never once said that in any of my videos. I'm like the worst YouTuber ever, apparently. Yeah, uh, the, the algorithm really likes it if you turn on notifications, and my percentage of subscribers who have notifications turned on is apparently really low. <laughs> so I would consider it to be a great personal favor if you would go ahead and ring that dinger. <laughs> the little bell that's right by the subscribe button. Anyway, also, before I actually even jump into the preamble today, I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about NordVPN as they are the sponsor for the video this week. In case you didn't know, using a VPN or virtual private network when you're getting online can have a lot of really nice benefits. When you're connected to a VPN, your internet traffic is redirected through a remote server, keeping people from knowing your actual location, your IP address, hiding your data from snoopers, etc. It can also be really handy to let you get access to like games, shows, or other software that might not be available where you're located, making it easy to change the location of where someone thinks you're getting online from, getting you access to content that might otherwise be blocked. NordVPN is a fantastic service in that it's super easy to use and really easy to connect to any server in the world, of which they have over 5,300 available in 60 different countries. It's got really great download speeds compared to other VPN providers and works on every major operating system. So if you're interested, please go check them out at nordvpn.com slash deep dive. I'll put that link in the video description as well, of course. If you sign up with them for a two-year plan and use that link, you'll actually get four months of additional service for free. Best of all, Nord has a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you've really got nothing to lose. Go ahead and try them out. Thanks to NordVPN, and let's jump into the preamble. First up, just want to let you guys know, a couple of weeks ago, I put a poll out on my channel asking for your feedback to what you'd like to see as far as the ratio of D&D to Pathfinder content. Not super surprisingly, and not particularly alarmingly, the Pathfinder videos I've been doing seem to be doing kind of worse and worse with each new one that I post, and they're getting significantly less traffic than the D&D videos. Thanks to everybody who replied there and for all the feedback and suggestions, etc. I do appreciate it. Right now, my plan is to continue doing Pathfinder content, but probably a little less frequently. I know that's going to upset some of you. I hope you'll bear with me anyway, and I know that's probably going to make some of you really happy. I've successfully split the party here, the party being you, uh, my viewers. <laughs> so anyway, I hope that regardless of whether you like or dislike it, that you will understand that I'm really just trying to do what's best for me for the channel as my own financial well-being greatly depends on... <laughs> the success of each video. Anyway, I still love both systems. I'm still playing both systems and think I probably will be for a little while to come. So thanks for being here with me for the journey. So yeah, five attacks per turn. Reliably? Like not just using action surge, right? Right. Of course, we do need to affix a little asterisk to that number. It's going to take us a few levels to get up to five attacks per turn. For us, we'll be getting there at level nine, but we are gonna have four attacks per turn as early as our initial damage report. And that, in and of itself, is really awesome. And even then at level nine, getting five attacks per turn will be using our resources and will only be something that we could do for an entire combat encounter if we were getting a short rest after each one, probably. At least until later on in our build. But still, 
we are going to be an absolute whirlwind of blows and it's going to be a ton of fun. Now, to get there, we're going to be doing something that I have surprisingly actually yet to try and that is to build a strength-based monk. I get a lot of requests to do a strength-based monk character, more of like a bruiser than a lithe, dexterous kung fu master, right? A way of the mountain monk as opposed to floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee. Your body is still a weapon, sure, but it's a sledgehammer. And yeah, the concept is maybe akin to the uh, pugilist Street Fighter build that I did a while ago. Again, at least thematically. The problem with trying to make a monk who largely ignores dexterity in favor of strength, of course, is that you're going to be pretty mad, multiple ability score dependent. Since you need a 13 in dexterity and wisdom in order to multi-class into or out of monk, and of course we're gonna be multi-classing. Come on, it's me we're talking about here. What's more, it's going to mean that our armor class is probably not going to be very great since we need a high dexterity for our AC unless we were to try and equip armor on our character and we're definitely not going to try and do that here. Despite these obstacles, however, I've been wanting to do a strength-based monk for a long time since every other monk that I've made is dexterity focused or in one case anyway, wisdom focused and it's an interesting concept to me. Happily, the end result is something that is, yeah, both really cool and decently powerful. Now, we are going to be building for sustained DPR. Yes, there is a way that you could build a character like this for burst damage and get way more than five attacks in a turn. I think I'll probably do a video on that character build that I have in mind that's got some similarities to this one, but some major differences too. That'll come later. For us, for now, we're gonna focus on trying to get five attacks per turn every round at least for an entire combat encounter. And yeah, when it works, it is, like I say, a frenzied whirlwind of attacks, like a Tasmanian devil. So yeah, I kind of like that name for this build, actually. Let's jump in. D&D &D episode 133, The Tasmanian Devil. Normally this is the part of the video where I point to Randall's artwork that he's created, but I'm gonna save it for later because it's gonna be a little bit of a spoiler if I were to show it now. So. Let's just jump right in. Level one, for our starting class. We're not gonna go with Monk to start off our character. <laughs> no, we are going to be a barbarian. A few weeks ago, my very favorite dudes, uh, the Dungeon Dudes, put out a video ranking barbarian multi-class options, and frankly, they inspired me. They gave the bonk, a barbarian monk, a C plus or a B minus for how good it is when you multi-class them together, depending on whether or not the DM would be willing to work with you a little. Well, I am not going to be asking for any special favors from the DM on this one. I feel like the end result of this character is gonna be maybe more like an A minus. Rules as written though. Let's see if I can come through. So yes, when we first meet our champion, I'm gonna say that they are a bit of a nomad or a hermit. They've left their barbarian tribe and cut themselves off from the rest of the world for two reasons. First of all, because they seek a higher wisdom through meditation, study, and a stoic lifestyle. But two, and maybe more importantly, they've become a danger to those they love, and they no longer wish to be a liability. As for our starting race, we are not actually going custom lineage or variant human. Can you believe it? I think that's two weeks in a row, right? New record, maybe? Anyway, no, we're actually going to go tortle here. So maybe less of a Tasmanian devil and more like an angry Master Uguay? <laughs> anyway, surprisingly for me, the main reason that we're going Tortle here is actually for defense. Though we do potentially get a small offensive bump early on. See, as I mentioned in the preamble, one big problem that this character is going to have is that their AC is going to kind of suck. We don't want to wear armor because monks, and because even though both monks and barbarians get unarmored defense, we're going to be a strength-based character, which means we won't have the points to put into a high dexterity score, which means that without wearing armor, which we're not going to do, our AC would never get very high. And at early levels especially, it would be pretty abysmally low. For that reason, 
I think the best solution for us is to go turtle. Mostly because, of course, turtles, very famously, have arguably the best natural armor feature in all of D&D. At least, the best natural armor for characters like us with a low dexterity score. Thanks to our trusty shell, we get a 17 AC. The drawbacks, of course, being that one, we don't get to add our dexterity modifier to that 17 like other races with natural armor do, though those are usually a 13 plus dexterity, right? But then two, we can't benefit from any other type of armor, and yes, this means even unarmored defense. I know some people get a little confused by this, so here's a little tweet from the illustrious Jeremy Crawford just in case you need some clarification on that. Basically. You can only benefit from one kind of armor in the game, whether that's actual armor or mage armor or unarmored defense or yes, natural armor. All clear? Okay, so yeah, a 17 AC isn't terrible. It's not amazing, but it's a lot better than where we would have been. And I'm sleeping a lot better at night with a 17 AC than I would be with the like 13 to 15 we would have had at best had we gone with another race. There is one small offensive benefit that turtles give us too, and it's their claws. Turtle claws can be used to make unarmed strikes, doing a D6 of slashing damage. And as we'll discuss later, monks typically get a D4 of bludgeoning damage until they hit monk level five anyway, so it will be a small increase to our unarmed strikes once we start making them, which isn't a big difference, but every little bit helps, so we'll welcome it. Turtles do get some other neat features as well. They can hold their breath for an hour, they get an extra skill proficiency, and can even withdraw into their shell as an action for a big AC bump, but they can't really do anything else while they're in there, so not something I imagine we'd be using all that often. As for our starting ability scores, I assume as always that we're going the point by method and would say let's take a 15 in strength and a plus one there, a 14 in constitution and our plus two there, so we'd have a 16 in both, then a 13 dexterity and a 13 wisdom. So yeah, it's a little weird to be making a character who will eventually, anyways, be mostly a monk who only has the bare minimum ability scores in both dexterity and wisdom. This isn't going to be awesome for our monk DC, so things like stunning strike, for example, but the low dexterity isn't something that will hurt us that much, aside from like our dexterity saving throws and initiative rolls and things like that. So we're not missing out on a ton by just having a 13 dex. I don't know, we're a different kind of monk. Not super wise, not super agile, but a powerhouse of rage and fury. As for our starting equipment, we don't need much. No armor necessary, but yeah, for the first few levels, we will want to be using a weapon, probably a great sword or a maul to get a little bit of extra damage out of it. I'd probably grab some javelins as well for ranged attacks when necessary. Otherwise, just grab your other basic necessities. As a Barbarian 1 then, we first up get Unarmored Defense. Like I said, but even though yes we are going naked here, we're not going to be taking advantage of this feature, relying instead on our shell. And then there's the quintessential Barbarian Rage feature that we love so very much. With Rage as a bonus action twice per day, currently we can rage for one minute, and while raging we get resistance to all bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, which is most of the damage that you'll be taking in-game, and makes that good, not great AC we have a lot more bearable than it otherwise would be. We also get to add two damage to all of our melee weapon attacks made with strength, and yes, just in case you weren't clear, unarmed strikes are considered melee weapon attacks when we start making those later on, so they too will benefit from that little bit of extra damage, which is fantastic. Rage also gives advantage on strength checks and saves, making us pretty great grapplers if we want to be. Rage prohibits us from casting or concentrating on spells, and ends early if we don't take damage or make an attack for an entire round. So yeah, be sure to keep some javelins or some other thrown weapon on you so that you can throw it at somebody just in case you end your move speed and you can't get in range to make a melee attack in the middle of combat, right? So that your rage doesn't expire. At level two, we get what's probably, I think, the Barbarian's strongest feature, Reckless Attack. Quite simply, when you make your first attack on your turn, you can decide to attack recklessly, and thereafter you get advantage on all of your attacks this turn. They should totally change that to be like until the beginning of your next turn, by the way. Otherwise, you won't get advantage on like opportunity attacks and things that happen during another character's turn, which is when opportunity attacks usually happen. Anyway, 
Unlimited use on-demand advantage is just so dang powerful. But of course, it comes with some caveats. First off, it too only works on strength-based melee weapon attacks, and again, yes, unarmed strikes will count. But then even more painfully, attacking recklessly gives enemies advantage against us until our next turn. Owie. At least we've got a 17 AC and resistance to most damage so long as we're raging, so that will go a long way to helping us stay alive. We also get Danger Sense here at Barbarian 2, which tells us that we have advantage on dexterity saving throws so long as we can see the fireball or trap or whatever that we're saving against, right? That's nice. It would be a lot nicer if we had a higher dexterity modifier, but it's okay. While dexterity saving throws are pretty common in game, we usually take half damage on them even if we do make our save, at least for now. At level three, we get a very important third rage per long rest, which should cover most if not all of our combat encounters in a day at most tables anyway. And then we get our barbarian subclass, our primal path. And yes, we are going with the one, the only, Path of the Beast. This is why our champion feels that they have become a danger to even those they hold dear, because there is perhaps some sort of lycanthropy that has taken over where the inner beast inside of us sometimes comes out and overcomes our own willpower and we go into like a blood frenzied rage. It's also a very important first step to getting a boatload of attacks each turn because Beast Barbarians get the Form of the Beast ability, which tells us that when we rage, we can transform and manifest a natural weapon. Very, very importantly, we are told that the weapon counts as a simple weapon for us. So remember that later. Each time we rage, we can choose which weapon manifests for us. There's three options. The bite option causes us to grow like a muzzle or mandibles that deal a D8 of damage with a bite attack and then can heal us. The tail option also does a D8 of damage, has reach, and gives us a reaction ability to try and block incoming attacks against us, which is super cool. But the claws, the claws are where it's at. The claw's gonna get you. This tells us that our hands transform into claws that do 1D6 damage on a hit, so long as our hands are empty. Wait a second, didn't our turtle claws already do this? Yeah, they did. But these form of the beast claws are much better in that if we use one of them to take the attack action with, we can make one additional claw attack as part of the same action. So we're getting two attacks here with the claw, so long as we are raging and transforming, right? Now, what this looks like for your character in game, I have no idea. Are the beast claws the same as your turtle claws? Do your claws just kind of get a little bit sharper or longer or, I don't know, narrower so you can swing them faster? It's a little weird but it works, mechanically at least. So yes, in a way, this is kind of like getting extra attack two levels before anyone else. Though the attacks have to be made with D6 weapons, it's still pretty fantastic. And of course, once we get the extra attack feature, we'd be making three attacks per turn with the attack action, right? At level four, we get our first ability score increase or feat, and I think we've got to bump strength if we're concerned about our damage. It's gonna take it to an 18, giving us a higher chance to hit, more damage on the hit, not to mention making us a better grappler, among other things. At level five, I actually really debated here about starting monk levels now. I know a lot of you probably think that would be crazy. I really, really hate redundant features on a build when I'm multi-classing characters, and we are eventually gonna have a lot more monk levels than barbarian, so we're gonna get to extra attack with monk, but even if we started right now, we wouldn't be getting extra attack until level nine, and that just is almost unconscionable when it's one more level in barbarian to get it now, right? It's going to make our damage report at level six so much stronger. I would say if you're really interested in jumping into Monk a little bit sooner, start it after Barbarian 3 and just try and beeline for that extra attack. It's going to be a little more painful along the way, but then once you get there, you'll kind of have a little bit of a head start over the way that we're going. Anyway, level 5, Barbarian 5, yeah, extra attack. And that means three attacks per turn with our claw, which is just awesome and super sustainable. But at level six, yes, it is time to finally start taking some monk levels here on this character. At this point, 
our character is just kind of redoubling their efforts, I think, to control the beast within via more intense meditation and spiritual training and focus. So, as a monk one, yes, we also get unarmored defense, except we don't actually because we can't benefit from a second unarmored defense if we already have the feature when we're multi-classing, and like I've said, we don't really want either of them anyway. The monk's version would let us add wisdom to our dexterity modifier when calculating AC if we're unarmored, we have a shell. More importantly, we get martial arts at monk one, and this is good stuff. It tells us that, so long as we're not using a shield or wearing armor, and we're not, we can use dexterity instead of strength for unarmed strikes or monk weapons, but we're not going to, right? Can, not must. Now, a word about monk weapons before moving on. Monk weapons are short swords and any simple melee weapons that don't have the heavy or two-handed property. Full stop. So, do our form of the beast claws count as monk weapons? Yes, they do. Rules as written, anyway. We are told that, for us, they are considered simple melee weapons. They don't have the heavy or two-handed property, so we should be fine here. Martial Arts also says that we can roll a d4 for unarmed strike damage instead of the usual one flat damage, but that the die goes up as we gain levels. Finally, when we take the attack action with an unarmed strike or a monk weapon, we can make an unarmed strike as a bonus action. Okay, so here's a question then. Do we get to make an unarmed strike with our turtle claws for a d6 of damage instead of the usual d4? This gets a little wonky. I would say yes, and I'm sure actually that most tables would say yes, but there is a weird thing where we're told that our form of the beast claws transform both of our hands. I can see some DMs saying that as such they have like replaced our turtle claws, and since the form of the beast claws attacks very much are not unarmed strikes, then we could no longer use our turtle claws for unarmed strikes. To me, that feels a little bit like straining at a gnat, and we're only talking about one point of damage on average, right? The difference between a d4 and a d6. So it's not a huge deal either way. When I crunch numbers, I'm going to assume that your unarmed strikes are still doing a d6. Come on, DMs. It's a monk for crying out loud. Let them have one more point of damage. <laughs> From the editing room, it strikes me as well that the turtle claws don't specify that the claws are on our hands only. So, seeing as how unarmed strikes can come in the form of kicks, I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't say, okay, my unarmed strikes are kicks and I'm making them with my clawed feet. But if you can't use your turtle claws, that's fine. You can always unarmed strike with your knees or elbows or feet or forehead, right? It doesn't just have to be your fists. Just take the d4 and try not to be annoyed. It'll go up to a d6 later anyway. So, hang on a second. We're a martial artist turtle who makes claw attacks? This isn't a Tasmanian devil, it's Jenica. <laughs> Jenny, you know, the female Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle? Look it up. Okay, at level 6, it's time for our first damage report, but now that I've got the core concept complete, you can see this fantastic artwork that Randall did for this character without getting any spoilers. Check out how amazing that is. He's a fantastic artist. If you'd be interested in following him on social media to check out the other stuff that he does, or potentially to reach out to him to see if you can commission him to create something for your character or even your entire party, I will put links in the video description as always. Thanks, Randall. This one is amazing. All right, yes. Level six, time for our first damage report. Let's discuss tactics here for our character. Let's see, you rage, run into combat, and then just hit stuff. A lot. Many, many hits. Sounds like a barbarian. Simple, effective, to the point. I like it. Okay, fine. At this point, it's not quite as many as it's going to be later. We get three claw attacks for our action, and then one more unarmed strike, which again, I will assume is a d6 for us. For some, it will be a d4. Not a huge deal either way. Each attack will be made with advantage, thanks to reckless attacks, and will add six damage, thanks to our strength modifier plus rage. And thus, against enemies with a 10 armor class here, we would on average be doing 39 damage per round. And against enemies with a 15 AC, it would be 35 DPR. And yeah, that's really quite strong compared to other sustained damage builds that I've done to date. Check the video description to see links to spreadsheets. It puts us kind of right in the middle of tier two, so better than most. And it's gonna get even a little bit better in the near future. At level seven, we would be a monk two and that means we get key. I love and hate key. Cool concept, not enough key points, my opinion. And 
probably yours as well. <laughs> we get one key point per monk level, and they reset on a short rest and are used to fuel basically everything that monks do. Right now, we can do three things with our key. Patient defense and step of the wind let us spend a key point and then take the dodge or dash actions as bonus actions, respectively. But flurry of blows is our bread and butter, letting us make two unarmed strikes as a bonus action instead of one if we spend a key point. We only have two key points at the moment, so no, this is not something we're going to be able to do every single round for an entire combat encounter, but that will change before too much longer. Now, one of the neatest features about monks that doesn't really show up in the spreadsheets is their unarmored movement feature. My friend Chris, Triant Monk, is doing a video series right now on ranking all of the racial options in 5e, and it's really fantastic, honestly, so you should check it out if you haven't. But in the first video of the series, he talks about how much weight he's giving to like increased or decreased move speed on races. And he gives it a lot of weight, as I think he should. There's nothing worse than having to take the dash action on your turn or like just throw a javelin instead of make four melee attacks because you could only get to within 10 feet of your enemy, right? Or I guess in our case, we could spend a key point and a bonus action to get there. Anyway, monks famously have the highest move speed of any character class in the game, and it gets better the more levels you put into the class. Right now, we get an extra 10 feet of move speed so long as we're not wearing armor or a shield, meaning we have a very nice 30 feet of move speed. Woot. That is one speedy tortoise. Slow and steady my ass. <laughs> that hair ain't got nothing on us. At level 8, we would be a monk 3, and that means we get a number of features. First up, deflect missiles. This lets us snatch an arrow right out of midair with our bare hands, and it is so awesome. When a ranged weapon attack hits us, we can use our reaction to reduce the damage by 1d10 plus our dex modifier. Oh, plus our monk level. Okay, so fine. Maybe instead of snatching it out of midair, we'll just make it graze us some of the time. <laughs> anyway. If we do reduce the damage to zero, we can spend a key point to make a ranged attack with it using our martial arts die for the damage. Super fun. But then we also get our monastic tradition, our monk subclass here, and I was a little torn on this. I think you've got two good options. The first is Mercy, which is probably the best subclass in the game for monks right now, generally speaking. You'd be fine to go this route, I think, but it is a little stronger with a better wisdom modifier. And I think for this build, the better option here for us is actually Kensei. And we'll get into why as we go. Kensei monks get the Path of the Kensei feature at Monk 3, and it's actually three little features in one. First, Kensei weapons let us choose a ranged and melee weapon to be our Kensei weapons, giving us proficiency with them and then making them monk weapons so long as they don't have the heavier special properties. We want to make our claws, which again are considered melee weapons for us, a Kensei weapon, though it's not going to really do much for us until later. Agile Parry is another feature here. We don't get a lot from it at the moment either because it tells us that if we make an unarmed strike as part of the attack action, then we can use our Kensei weapon to defend ourselves, giving us a plus two to AC, which is nice, but it says we have to be holding the Kensei weapon, and we're not technically. It's just manifested there, right? So sure, a lot of semantics here. Very likely that your DM would allow it, but I don't think it works rules as written. So why are we going Kensei if all of the features that we get at level three aren't really doing anything for us? You'll see. Just hang tight a bit. And like I said, feel free to go Mercy instead if you want for some healing and potentially burst damage capabilities, especially if the campaign is going to end before you get to Monk level 6. At level 9, we would be a Monk 4, and that means another ability score increase or feat. I think we've got to cap our strength here, taking it to 20. It's definitely the best thing we could do for our damage anyways. Monks also get the really cool slow fall feature at Monk 4, which lets us reduce falling damage by 5 times our monk level, which means we could fall now for 50 to 60 feet on average and land gently as a feather. And while no, this might not come up all that often in game, I will say this. As much as I and several others like to bemoan the monk's relative underpoweredness in D&D 5e, and it feels especially bad when compared to the Pathfinder monk, check that out here if you're interested, and I think that might be my last card for the week. Anyway, monks do get a lot of stuff that's useful and cool that 
like I said earlier, just doesn't show up on the spreadsheet. I mean, most classes just get an ability score increase at level four. We get a cool little bonus slow fall ability as well. At level three, most classes just get subclass features. We get a nice little deflect missiles trick. More move speed, stunning strike, and extra attack at level five, where most marshals are only getting extra attack, right? There are definitely scaling and damage issues that monks suffer from, but maybe we shouldn't discount all the extra useful and super cool features that they get along the way so much, yeah? I think that's my short. Okay, at level nine, let's check in with another damage report. Since last check, we have capped our strength modifier, and maybe more importantly, I think at this level, I am going to start assuming that we'll be using flurry of blows every round. Again, my requirement to consider a build sustainable for damage purposes has always been that they be able to do this much damage for at least one entire combat encounter. With four key points, and considering that on round one we're going to need our bonus action to rage, right? That means we'll be able to use flurry of blows every turn on a combat encounter that lasts five rounds. And yeah, the vast majority of combat encounters in 5e are over by round five, if not sooner. And remember, our key points do reset on a short rest. So I think it fair to consider it sustainable that we're using flurry of blows as per my own predefined rules. It might not work for you on every single turn for every single fight in every single day, but I think at most tables, we should be able to flurry of blows most if not all of the time for most combat encounters. So yes, I am now assuming that we're making five attacks per turn, adding now seven damage to each for our strength plus our rage, with advantage and a plus nine to hit on every attack. And so against enemies with a 10 armor class, we would now be doing 54 damage per round on average, and against enemies with a 16 AC, it would be 49 DPR. And that's a considerable bump since last time. Compared to other sustained DPR builds at this level, that's like, upper half of tier two. Nice work, little Tasmanian devil. <laughs> that means thank you in Tasmanian devil. <laughs> kind of sounded more like a murloc. At level 10, we would be a monk five, and that means we get extra attack again. And it makes me mad. <laughs> but yeah, until what would have been character level nine for us just Ugh, I just, I couldn't do it. But fortunately, like I said, we get another feature at level five, so it doesn't feel like a total waste, right? And it is potentially a really good one, though it is oft maligned, stunning strike. Some people think it's overpowered. Some think it's mostly worthless. Nobody seems to just kind of like think it's pretty good. <laughs> I don't know, I think it's situationally pretty good. So much so, in fact, that I once did an entire character build around the idea of trying to make Stunning Strike as effective as possible. Uh, the Fate Weaver, the ultimate re-roller, which I don't think I have a card for, but that's what the thumbnail looked like. Anyway, with Stunning Strike, you hit with a melee weapon attack. Yes, this includes unarmed strikes. You spend a key point, and if they fail, they are stunned until the end of our next turn, which is quite potent indeed. The problems being, of course, that the enemy gets to make a constitution saving throw to avoid it, and that means there's a high likelihood that you will have spent one of your very few key points for nothing. Also, we need a high wisdom modifier for it to work even semi-reliably, since that is what our monk DC is based off of, and it's really tough to get that wisdom modifier very high if we also want to be focusing on increasing our damage, right? Unless we're an astral self monk, I suppose. Anyway, when stunning strike sticks, Stunning an opponent until your next turn is so strong, keeping them from doing basically anything and giving all attacks against them advantage. Finally, at this level, yes, don't forget that our martial arts die does go up to a d6. So even if your DM wasn't letting you make unarmed strikes with your tortal claws, it doesn't matter anymore because we're going to be doing a d6 of damage regardless. At level 11, we would be a monk 6, and that means we get some really important stuff. First off, Key Empowered Strikes makes our Unarmed Strikes magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance, which is really nice for those of us who haven't managed to get our hands on an Insignia of Claws or something, right? But also, as a Kensei, we get the Magic Kensei Weapons feature, and it's actually one of the main reasons I wanted to go Kensei in the first place. See, one big drawback to using our Bestial Claws for all of the attacks we make with the attack action is that well, magic weapons exist in D&D, right? And not having magic weapons can potentially really hurt our power. Hopefully, 
you've got a kind DM that will give you some sort of magic fist wraps or brass knuckles or, I don't know, fingernail paint maybe? Like, for our claws? Anyway, something to let you keep up with other martial characters that are probably running around with flame tongue, long swords, or plus two weapons by now, right? But just in case you don't have that very kind DM, at the very least, we need our claw attacks to be considered magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance like our unarmed strikes are now, right? Of course, we could have gone another level into Beast Barbarian to accomplish that, but again, now I'm just putting more levels into a class that I'm not otherwise getting a lot out of and delaying those monk features even further. But as a Kensei monk, we get to cover all of our attacks now with that magical property, since magical Kensei weapons tells us that our Kensei weapons now too are also considered magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance. And remember, our claws are Kensei weapons. And that is just a nice little bit of synergy that makes me happy. I love efficiency. It almost makes up for the fact that I got extra attack twice. Deft Strike is another cool feature that we get here at this level that tells us that if we hit with a Kensei weapon, we can spend a key point to cause extra damage equal to our martial arts die. Ooh, can we? Spend one of our very few key points for an extra d6 of damage? Of course I wouldn't be wasting a key point on that. Don't forget, our unarmored movement goes up another 5 feet here as well, giving us a total of 45 feet of move speed. Woo wee! At level 12, we would be a monk 7, and that means we get evasion, which would be way better if we had a high dex modifier. <laughs> as it is, with only a plus 1 to our dex save, it's less good. But hey, We've got advantage on those saves thanks to Barbarian, and now if we succeed we take no damage, and if we fail we only take half, so it'll still be nice regardless of that dexterity modifier. We also get Stillness of Mind at this level, and it's either pretty great or pretty terrible depending on how your DM rules it. Stillness of Mind lets us use our action to end a charmed or frightened effect on ourselves, but the problem is that lots of charmed and frightened things sort of explicitly prohibit us from using our action, so in those situations this is a little bit worthless. That said, at my table, I know at a lot of others, it's ruled that this can sort of override the you can't take an action when you're under this fear effect or whatever. If it's that way at your table, then this feature is a lot stronger. Otherwise, it's just okay. At level 13, we would be a monk 8, and that means another ability score increase or feat. I think I would probably bump constitution here. Part of me really wants to do like a plus 1 to dex and a plus 1 to wisdom to get both to 14. I mean, both of those are very important saving throws, and I really hate having odd numbered ability scores. I'd love for our stunning strike to have at least a slightly better chance at sticking, and I mean a better initiative bonus and dexterity based skills and perception would all be really nice too. But the reality is, if we were to take our dexterity and wisdom to 14, it's not going to bump our armor class at all. The 17 from our shell is still going to be better, and a 14 wisdom is still pretty low, meaning our stunning strike still won't work nearly as often as we'd like, considering the constitution saving throw, right? So yeah, I think I'd probably just bump constitution here to give us a better constitution saving throw, more hit points, or, you know, maybe even take the tough feat. More hit points are always great, and for those of us who are raging barbarians taking half damage on most stuff and attacking recklessly, so we're probably going to be getting hit most of the time anyway, having a big bag of hit points feels way more important than just about anything else we could do here to me. Okay, it's time for our level 13 damage report, and let's talk about key, because, you know, we've got 8 key points now, and I mean, if the average combat encounter lasts 3 to 5 rounds, which I think is pretty accurate. That means we could theoretically have about two key points to spend per turn after round one, right, when we're raging. I'm not saying this is advisable, but since I am exploring the limits of what's possible, not necessarily advisable, sure, let's just assume, for argument's sake, that you're blowing a key point for Flurry of Blows and another one for Deft Strike every single turn to get that extra d6 of damage. I for sure wouldn't do this in game unless I felt really confident that the enemy was like this close to dying, right? Or really confident that I was going to get a short or long rest after this combat encounter was over. But sure, 
let's pretend that that's the case. In addition, since last check, we've gotten some nice utility and defensive and ribbon buffs, but that's about it. So at this level, against enemies with a 10 armor class, we would be doing 58 damage per round on average, and against enemies with a 17 armor class, it would be 53 DPR. And yeah, that's almost exactly the same as last check. <laughs> So now, compared to other DPR builds that I've done to date, at this level we're like down to bottom of tier 3 or maybe even like top of tier 4. We are going to get a couple more little bumps along the way as we progress through the end, so just hang tight. But yes, we're definitely seeing kind of the weakness of both monks and barbarians here as they just don't scale all that well into mid and late game damage wise. Speaking of which, yes, at level 14, we would be a monk nine. And that means that we get an unarmored movement improvement. It tells us that we can move across liquids and up vertical surfaces with our movement. And while that is so freaking awesome, conceptually. It's the only thing we get at Monk 9, unless you count the extra key point. Remember like 15, 20 minutes ago when I was talking about how great it was that we were getting all of these fun and useful and cool ribbon-like monk features at the same time as we were getting other important and powerful ones? Yeah, welcome to the desert that is mid to late game monkdom. <laughs> But we will press on undaunted because there is some good stuff on the horizon. At level 15, we'd be a monk 10, and we get purity of body. This tells us that we are now immune to all disease and poison, and that's really not bad at all. Disease doesn't come up all that often most of the time in 5e, but when it does, it can be fairly penalizing, and poison comes up kind of all the time. So yeah, having immunity to both, it's pretty nice. At level 16, we would be a monk 11 though, and this is a big level for us. It's kind of what we've really been aiming for. Because our martial arts die goes up to a d8, this means that we could get a teeny bump not only to our unarmed attacks and deft strike, but we could even replace one of our bestial claw attacks that we're making with the attack action with an unarmed strike and get a little more damage that way. Remember, the rules for form of the beast say that when we attack with a claw using the attack action, we can make one additional claw attack as part of the same action. We get three attacks with our attack action, right? And it doesn't say that all three of the attacks that we get have to be with our claws, only two of them. So we could like claw, knee, claw, elbow, finish it off with a roundhouse to the face, all in one turn, every single turn. I seriously love the image of that so dang much. Of course, you know, you could have been doing this all along, right? Had you found a good weapon, let's say a longsword, as soon as you got the ability to make three attacks with your attack action with your claw, right? You could have, quite a long time ago, done a claw, weapon attack, claw, unarmed strikes. I don't often think about that just because I'm so focused on like the claw attacks and the unarmed strikes, but doing so could have given us a very, very small damage bump, probably on average something like 0.7 more damage per round. So it's not going to be a huge impact unless, of course, it's a nice magical weapon. But, of course, you wouldn't actually want to be replacing one of your claw attacks with an unarmed strike most of the time, assuming you had the key, because we also get, at Monk 11 here, my favorite Kensei feature, Sharpen the Blade. Finally, we can sort of keep up with our magic weapon using friends, even if our DM wasn't giving us some magic like fingernail polish. Sharpen the blade lets us use a bonus action to spend up to three key points to grant one Kensei weapon a bonus to attack and damage equal to the number of key that we spent. And this lasts for one minute. A plus three to hit and damage is the equivalent of a rare magical weapon, right? A purple. And that's really nice. Plus three claws. Rare. And I mean, at this point, we've got the key to spend, so I'm not sweating those three key points like I probably would have earlier on in the build. Finally, at this level, our move speed goes up another five feet. That means 50 total feet of move speed. And then coming down the home stretch at level 17, we would be a monk 12, and that means another ability score increase our feet. And yeah, depending on what I did last time, I'd probably be bumping constitution here or taking tough. And you know, if you think about it, 
even had we bumped constitution with these last two ability score increases and capped it at a 20, unarmored defense is still not as good as our shell. We'd have a 16 AC. Had we found a way to bump our AC by one, maybe by taking a different race, mountain dwarf or a half elf or something, then we would just be at an AC of 17 now. So yeah, Tortle is definitely the way to go for a strength-based bonk. For our final damage report then, since last check, we haven't seen huge increases, but some small ones to our damage. Our unarmed strikes and deft strike are up to a d8, and better yet, our claw attacks are now a plus three to hit and damage. In addition, we've gotten a lot of nice, cool utility and defensive buffs too, which shouldn't be totally ignored. But at this level against an enemy with a 10 armor class, on average, we would be doing 70 damage per round. And against enemies with an 18 AC, it would be 67 DPR. So yeah, some small increases, nothing huge, kind of keeps us near the bottom of tier three compared to other builds at this level. So what are our final thoughts on the character? The, the tier score, if you take the damage that they did at each of the armor classes that we calculated for at each of the four damage reports, just average it all into one big number, you'd end up with a 47. And that's kind of middle of tier three. But, you know, keep in mind that these are all builds that I've done with the goal of creating a high sustained damage character, right? I mean, this Tasmanian Devil is in the company of some pretty good, powerful builds. They're right up there with the Fey Wanderer Ranger, the Cyclaw, the Moon Druid, and not too far from just the kind of generic run-of-the-mill great weapon master polearm master using fighter barbarian which a lot of people think of as one of the highest damage dealing characters you can build in D&D 5e. But I mean sure, the reality is that while making a lot of attacks per turn is fun and powerful, to really get the most mileage out of it, we need more ways for the damage per hit to scale past level 9 or 10, right? The plus 2 damage bonus from Rage is almost as good as like a Hex or a Hunter's Mark spell, but can't really compete with like Spirit Shroud, for example, that scales really nicely as you continue to gain higher level spell slots, right? That said, Throughout the early to mid game, you're punching with some of the best builds I've ever done for sustained DPR. You're outpacing the Eldritch Blade Master, the Shadow Blade, the Sniper. And I mean, seeing as how most D&D campaigns end around levels 10, 11, or 12, it makes the build feel a lot stronger, I think, than my little tier score actually gives it credit for. The problem, of course, is that monks and barbarians both are two of the worst scaling classes in all of D&D 5e, as I've kind of talked about, at least damage-wise. And we've tried to combine both of them into one character. It works really great up until you hit that point at which their scaling kind of plateaus, right? And then, yeah, you're going to struggle a little bit to keep up with the damage. Still, and again, we shouldn't discount what this character can bring outside of damage. They'd be a fantastic grappler, so we've got some really strong control options there. And grappling would not diminish our DPR at all, except for on the round that we're making a grapple attack, right? We can still claw and unarmed strike with like a knee or an elbow or a headbutt, still getting five attacks in a round against a grappled target or somebody else if they're standing nearby. Not only that, but we can definitely take a beating, making us a great frontliner. And we have all of that really cool, fun, and useful utility that monks bring to boot. <sighs> Where would Kelly and Monty rate this on their uh, tier list? I don't know. I feel like it's gotta at least be a little bit better than the C plus B minus they initially gave it. Maybe a B plus, maybe an A minus if we're stopping our campaign at level nine or 10, right? But in the end, I would personally have a lot more fun playing this character than just a straight up beast barbarian for sure. And yeah, I think that playing a character that's a lot of fun and powerful is kind of the point of everything that I do on this channel, right? So. I think it checks both of those boxes. But that's the build for the week. I hope you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun making it. I love you guys. You are so fantastic. Thank you so much for all that you do for me, for the channel. I would not be here without you. I hope you have a really fantastic day and a great week. But if you don't, I hope you hang in there. I hope to see you again really soon. But in the meantime, stay safe, be good, be kind, and take care.
Hmm. Hmm. Ah. Oh. What if we go with a nice, like, peach? Match the stripes in my shirt. When I was born, they looked at me and said, What a good boy, what a smart boy, what a strong boy. And when you were born, they looked at you and said, what a good girl, what a smart girl, what a pretty girl. Now, can I get the mic to stay in its place? No. No, I just can't. I have been fighting with this guy lately. Does not want to do what I tell him. Kind of like you guys when I tell you to have a good day. <laughs> this name is the hair shirt I wear. And this hair shirt is woven from your brown hair This song is the cross that I bear Bear with me, bear with me, bear with me Be with me tonight dun, 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 dun. And know that it isn't right dun, 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 dun. Be with me tonight Hmm, I love bare naked ladies. Wait. Oh, man. For some reason, it was recording in a 4 3 ratio. And I'm glad that I caught it early. I just had started into my preamble. And it was terrible. <sighs> it would make everything look better. Time to redo some numbers. And yes, a couple of times, well, don't even say that, because that's no longer true. Hmm, I hate it when I thought I pushed record and I didn't. I gotta redo about 15 minutes worth of recording. Ah.